from South, uh, South Cloak Hen or Cloak Hen's Dyke um, is named in the boundary clause attached to Charter 146 in the Book of Sand Aff. Uh, the Charter records a supposed donation of an estate at Sangors in Powys, that's the modern Powys, not the historic Powys, um, by King Ast of Brecaignog uh, and his sons sometime in the, the early to mid um, 8th century. Although the boundary clause probably dates to the um, uh, early 11th century. Now, dikes are comparatively common features in the Flandaf Charter boundary clauses, um, but this one is interesting because, uh, uh, as Patrick Sims Williams has, has noted, um, its name uh, refers to uh, Thuark Hen, a legendary Brythonic ruler um, of Welsh medieval poet poetic tradition. So in this paper, I'm going to first try to identify uh, this dike, try to find it, uh, examine its function as part of the agricultural landscape, um, and then move on. Then I'm going to do a bit of theory and move on to consider the monument as a boundary feature. Um, very briefly, though, first I'd like to uh, talk through the, the source, the, the Book of Llandaff, because um, they're quite complex. So the charters of the Book of Llandaff um, are a complex source. Um, I'm not going to go into them in detail, uh, but suffice to say the book was written in the 12th century, uh, but it contains a considerable amount of earlier material, including a substantial corpus of uh, medieval charters. Um, and this particular charter, which is on the screen, um, contains a lot of 12th century interpolated um, uh, formulae, um, and the witness list has been appropriated from another charter. But uh, Professor Wendy Davis has argued that there is a genuine record lying at its, um, at its core. Um, the boundary clause attached to the charter uh, was not integral to the original text, um, but Jonathan Coe um, has demonstrated that these are early records. Um, they can be, most of them, many of them can be traced on the ground with a high, de high degree of accuracy, and Coe has dated this particular boundary clause to uh, around uh, 1010 to 1030 AD. Um, so the first question is um, what and where is Cloark Hen's Dyke? Uh, no feature of that name is recorded on the OS map or any other maps. Uh, there's nothing on the HER um, which would fit that description. So uh, if we want to find the dyke we've got to start with the boundary clause um, which can be given as follows. From the mouth of the spring of the Twelve Saints in Thangorse Lake, hotwoods along the brook as far as the spring head to the end of the dike of Cloark Hen, along the dike until it falls into the Slumby, and, and etc. Um, so, uh, the dike lies between the spring of the Twelve Saints and the river Slumby. Um, the location of the spring, which is clearly a, a holy spring, and we'll return to that later, uh, is not known. Um, but on the basis of the direction of the um, boundary clause and the, the rivers mentioned in it, which we can identify in the lake, um, we can um, suggest that the spring rose and flowed in the Slangorse Lake from the east. Um, now, several brooks flow into the lake from this, this uh, direction, and my research, which I, I won't go into here, has led me to believe that the three springs I've identified on this, this map um, are the strongest candidates. Now these all rise on um, the open pasture on Mun of Slangors, um, but are located uh, just above the medieval parish boundary. Um, so here's the open common, uh, the parish boundary kind of following that. Um, and that parish boundary follows a substantial hollow way and field bank that runs along the upper limit of the post medieval enclosure. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, you've got the common up here and the enclosed post medieval enclosure down here and it's this sort of hollow way with a field bank on one side. Um, there's a view, there's Slangorse Lake below. This is taken from the open common, that's almost certainly the spring of the Twelve Saints. Um, and this is the uh, the dive the earthwork uh, in front of us there. Um, now the course of this boundary can be followed for some distance um, and it departs from the parish boundary and, and after it departs from the parish boundary 
it's possible to trace a route which falls into the Flanvi. Um, so matching the, the description of the bounds. Um, thus, we have a substantial earthwork which is close to the location of the likely location of the Spring of the Twelve Saints, which in large part follows a later parish boundary and broadly matches the uh, description of the boundary clause. So um, I'm suggesting that uh, this is the, the dike of, of Fluark Hen. Um, and this is its course, um, so it's uh, and the so the boundary goes up and around, and then back to to the lake. So if we found it, um, what was it for? Well, this is not a uh, defensive earthwork akin to Offa's Dyke or, or Watts Dyke. Um, rather, it's um, <laughs> what is known in in Welsh as a penclaw, um, or head dyke or corn ditch. This was an agricultural land boundary that separated lowland infield from unenclosed uh, pasture. Um, so it uh, would originally have been topped by a hedge and its primary function was to keep graving livestock on Manish Langors. Um, such boundaries are features of infield outfield farming systems across Britain uh, and were fundamental to the structure of the agricultural landscape. Um, indeed, we can be confident that the dike was part of a was part of a, a, a agricultural system that was in operation well before the bounds of this this estate were written down. Um, this is likely to be quite an ancient feature, um, or perhaps one of a series of boundaries which migrated up and down slope over time, and, and that's been seen in, in in other areas. Now, I could spend more time considering the agricultural context of the monument, um, but since this is tag, I'm going to move on and and try and do some theory. Um, so, but in order to do this, I need to provide a little bit of context um, on Llangors and, um, and why it's important. So, uh, well, there's just a nice shot. You can see the prominent kind of, that's the bike there, heading across the, um, the unenclosed um, upland above. Um, so, uh, context of Llangors. Flaudaf Charter suggests that kings were active in, uh, and we're in Brecainog, the region of Wales, um, suggests that there were kings granting land within Brecainog from the, probably from the early 8th century. Uh, but it's not known if Brecainog was actually a kingdom at this point. Um, the first reliable reference to the kings of Brecainog, rather than just kings in Brecainog, um, is in the uh, life of Alfred the Great when Asa recounts how uh, the king of Brecainog, being driven by the might of the sons of Rodri Mauer, sought the lordship of King Alfred. Now, kings are associated with Llangors in a uh, series of four of the, um, three of the Llandaf charters. Um, the B and C texts of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle record a Mercian raid against Llangors in 916, uh, in which the king's wife was captured. So we've got a sort of body of historical evidence associating royalty uh, with Flangors. Um, and this also relevant here are stories recounted in the 12th century in uh, Gerald of Wales and, and Walter Mapp, uh, who refer to, to uh, stories which associate royal connections to Flangors. Now the historical, so these historical sources are comparatively uh, rich, really, from, for Wales, and they're complemented nicely by the archaeological evidence. So we've got excavations on the unique uh, 9th to 10th century Cranog in Flangors Lake, conducted by, by Alan Lane and Mark Redknapp. Alan's in the back. Um, this work identified a range of high-status um, settlement evidence, including fine metal work, part of a, a unique textile. Um, so it's this island residence within the lake. Um, and... Uh, um, the site's interpreted as a royal residence and a state, a state centre occupied in the late 9th and 10th centuries. And indeed, um, Anna and Mark have linked the Cranog's abandonment with the Mercian raid of 916. Now, Brecanyog ceased to exist as an independent kingdom sometime in the mid to 10th century when it was subsumed within one of its neighbours. And we know little about uh, Llangors after this time. But by the 12th century, um, it was in the possession of Brecon Priory, and it's possible that it was held by the church prior to the Norman Conquest. Um, the evidence for this coming from another one of the charters, um, and indeed that's, that's how it ended up in the Book of Llandaff, because it was a church possession, ultimately. Um, 
and there is actually uh, some um, pieces of sculpture from the uh, from the Norman from the medieval church in Llangor, suggesting that was an important centre prior to the conquest. So the evidence for Llangor is is rich, um, and it suggests that we've got a centre of royal and later ecclesiastical authority, um, which appears to have seen a certain amount of conflict um, from uh, an Anglo-Saxon raid. But there's also hints that there's inter-British feuding going on with um, the kings of Bretagne seeking um, Alfred's protection. So, so who was Thuark Hen? Um, so the name is recorded in a genealogical, genealogical tract purportedly relating to the kings of the Old Norse, North. Sorry. And it's possible that Thuark, Thuark the Old lived and ruled um, during the 6th century. Um, however, it's not the historical Thuark um, that was invoked in the name of this dyke. In early medieval Wales, Thuark Hen was known primarily for a substantial body of poetry, composed well after the historical figure's death. Um, now, while such literary allusions in place names may seem abstract, we must remember that place names and oral tradition, and the oral tradition which perpetuated place names, had considerable significance in a world with no maps and few written records. Place names and place name stories helped to establish a sense of place for people within their landscapes and were particularly important um, for the maintenance of boundaries um, um, which had to be actively maintained and re-inscribed on both the physical landscape and the cultural memory of the local population. Um, the importance of this oral tradition within this process is evident in the fact that whilst the text of early medieval charters was usually in Latin, the boundary clauses are usually in the vernacular. So the boundary clauses are read out and people can understand them and, and remember them. Um, now, boundaries were also reinforced for their perambulation and the performance at rituals at particular points along the processional route. Um, and this is very important. And the names of the boundary features and the oral traditions associated with them um, formed uh, mnemonic pegs that, um, that gave structure to the uh, uh, process of cultural memorization, to the process of memoring uh, the, these boundaries. Um, this was because as oral traditions became fixed in a landscape, so the moral of the story and the place name um, came together to, to reproduce each other. So, so Place name stories that are rooted in the fabric of the landscape acquire ideological significance and had the power to perpetuate tradition and engender particular understandings of the world for the establishment of social norms and the legitimization of claims to land. Now this is something which Alex Wolfe has, has explored through um, uh, metaphorical, the real and the metaphorical use of landscape in the Historia Bretonum um, and he's, he's arguing for um, Iron Age, uh, ruined Iron Age hill forts being used as, as mnemonic devices to, to bring a, invoke um, ideas of, of divine, um, divine uh, providence. So the Lark Hen poems survive in, in documents of the 13th century and later, but the material at least, or at least some of it is much older, probably composed in the 8th or 9th. The verses are narrated from the perspective of Lark Hen. Um, one set of verses takes the form of a dialogue between Thuark and his son, um, in which Thuark goads his son into unwise and ultimately fatal battle with the, with the Anglo-Saxons. Um, the second set of verses take the form of a lament, in which Thuark bemoans his foolish actions and his fading abilities uh, with age. Um, now the narrative context of the poetry is, is, would have been known to its audience, but is lost to us. Um, so it's difficult to interpret uh, the meaning of this poetry, uh, but it's certainly not praise poetry. This isn't, um, the Thuark story is about the violation of, of social norms, and the verses come across as a warning rather than, uh, rather than an exemplar. Now, how am I doing for time? I'm fine. Okay. Now, several places in Bricanyog can be identified in the poetry, and Patrick Sims Williams has argued that uh, it was composed at Flangorse, um, largely on the basis of this, um, of this boundary clause feature. Uh, now, it's difficult to prove that the poetry was composed at Flangors, um, but the themes recounted uh, in, the, in the poetry is, 
um, strike a chord with Flangors. Uh, Flangors and Bracagnog being uh, inter-British feuding, battles against Anglo-Saxons and the defence of borders. These are recurrent themes and these resonate with Flangors, uh, a royal estate in a border territory threatened by Gwynedd and raided by the Mercians at least once. So antecedents of the surviving poems were no doubt recounted at Flangors, perhaps in the hall within the Cranog, um, and in open air festivals when the free men of the region came together to sing songs, recite pedigrees and hear the tales of uh, heroic heroism of their, of their ancestors. Now, Cloark's association with the dyke is therefore more likely to reflect an onomatic, onomastic tale than a historical record of its builder. Um, the moral of this tale is lost to us, although intriguingly a central verse of the Cloark hen poetry is Cloark's son um, and his death at, the, at his last stand against the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of the Green Dyke. Um, so it may not be coincidence that, uh, and this is something which Patrick Sims Williams has, has noted, that this, this boundary could be, is likely to be on the east and north side of the estate at Fangors, which is the, the direction which an Anglo-Saxon attack probably would have come. So it's not wild speculation to suggest that an onomastic tale associated with Cloark Hen was performed at the dyke during the per perambulation of the estate's bounds. And the story would have been known to those who crossed the dyke as they moved into and out of Opland pastures. By narrating the story through the landscape and rooting it in the con concrete details of an ancient feature that formed the backbone of the agricultural landscape, the story acquired mythic value, mythic value and historical re relevance. Thus, Thuark, I argue that Thuark Hen's Lament served as a didactic that enforced knowledge of both the physical extent of the estate and the status, and perhaps most importantly, responsibilities of those who held it. This was not, then, an overtly defensive military earthwork. It was certainly not built by Thuark Hen, neither was it simply a convenient feature with which to construct a boundary clause. It was a moral tale made real, and part of how a centre of power and authority was defined, both physically and metaphorically. Now, early in this talk, I briefly mentioned uh, another boundary clause feature called uh, the Spring of the Twelve Saints, uh, which lies immediately adjacent to the dike. Now, in a forthcoming publication, I argue that this Holy Spring um, is associated with the Twelve Apostles, these are the Twelve Saints, um, whose cult was being propagated in South Wales on a fairly small scale during the 10th and 11th centuries. Um, now the spring is no doubt also associated with a body of oral tradition, <coughs> which is lost to us, and it's possible that its waters may have offered some sort of spiritual protection to the estate. Um, but there may be more to the juxtaposition of the dike and the spring than um, first appears. Um, Explicitly Christian features, like the Spring of the Twelve Saints, are actually quite rare in boundary clauses. Um, and John Blair has said that um, um, boundary perambulation was still, in the late 10th and early 11th centuries, essentially a secular activity, um, which had not yet been assimilated into the liturgical um, ritual. Um, and in this regard, it's interesting that the majority of the possible Holy Springs in the... Uh, other Flandaf charters are all very all in the later boundary clauses. Boundary clauses dating from the from the eleventh, effectively from the eleventh century. Um, so I think it's likely that the Spring of the Twelve Saints, or at least the Spring's Christian associations, um, are a comparatively late addition to an earlier um, boundary clause. And we know that these boundary clauses go through periods, go are re-edited and reworked. Um, you can tell that from their, from their um, orthography. Um, so it's intriguing, therefore, that the estate appears to have come into the possession of the church sometime after 916. So but the stories with Cloark Hen are, overly, uh, are overtly secular and would no doubt have been sort of unpalatable to the church. Um, nevertheless, they were part of how the estate was inscribed in cultural memory and could not be easily er erased or forgotten. You can't just simply rename things. 
Um, so therefore I will finish by suggesting that the Spring of the Twelve Saints represented an attempt to Christianise the bounds and the stories associated with them after the estate had come into the possession of the church. Thank you very much.